But I think that having, a, having the most positive view of the future is, 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 is the best way forward. Um, I mean, this, this, is, this is also true in, in terms of sort of technology. I mean, the moment we live in, uh, uh, in a time of technological advancement and upheaval, completely unparalleled in, uh, in, in human history. Um, I had, I had an insight into uh, this when I was flying over from London at the weekend uh, on a Qantas flight. And uh, I watched a movie, and there was a filler after the movie, which was a program called The Big Bite, which is a news program about computers. And I was watching it, getting increasingly puzzled, because this... Um, I mean, we're talking about you know, how to install sort of four megabytes of RAM into your computer and uh, didn't mention the web at any point and was doing this and that. And eventually I saw the... Uh, I mean, it, it seemed antediluvian what they were talking about. And I thought, well, I know Australia is an advanced country. And, I thought, well, so, so. Um, and uh, eventually it, I, I, looked, I, I watched out for the copyright sign at the end. It was 1994. Um, so this is... A, a, a news program about technology that Qantas was showing that was made in 1994. Um, and, uh, but what was extraordinary was how incredibly ancient and clunky and antediluvian this stuff appeared. And it's only five years ago. But we, we, have, we, we, we are travelling at an extraordinary rate along a technological path. Now, I actually have no problem with that. I actually think it's, it's extremely exciting. And... Uh, but the most important thing is that we we embrace it for all its positive aspects, and we it's um, um, if we take the kind of Blade Runner view of the future that everything is going to look like a sort of rusty version of Los Angeles, then that's what we'll get. Um, I, I, I mentioned my wife earlier. My wife is a great skier, which I am not. I have this problem with skiing, which I have a. Um, uh, I have a terrible sense of uh, I have terrible vertigo, which is an irrational fear of. Uh, of heights, but I also have a very rational fear of falling over and hurting myself because I'm because <laughs> um, I tend to do that a lot. Um, and um, but she tells me, she always tells me what I'm doing wrong skiing, which is that if I, I'm going down a, a, a steep path and I tend to sort of lean in towards the slope rather nervously, trying to make myself go slower. As a result, I sort of I don't I'm not in control of what I'm doing. I tend to fall over and hurt myself. Whereas she, who just sort of goes for it. And she leans out from the slope and just charges down the hill in complete control and gets there and has a great time. And uh, it seems to me that's, that in many ways is the view we have to take. We are living in a time of enormous possibility. Enorm we are inventing the future uh, you know, daily. Um, but we have to take the most optimistic view of that. We have to understand the way we can use that to create a good future be aware of the problems and be aware of the problems I've been talking about, but don't, we should also, we should not be hypnotized by those into allowing those problems to take us over. The next question is from Louise Dodson. Louise Dodson, Financial Review. Uh, following on from that uh, answer, do you think you have to actually introduce the market, dare one say it, from a financial newspaper? Uh, you obviously have in your latest book, you've You've turned it into, if I might say so, a bit of an adventure story, to presumably to popularise it. And the animals, you yourself were saying uh, uh, in your speech, you know, the cute and the quirky sort of animals. Uh, so, so do you think that's very important to, to uh, create a market, to put a dollar value on it, if you like, to popularise it, to make it important to preserve those species? Well, this is, this is a very con controversial area and a very controversial issue for a lot of people who are sort of concerned with um, um, you know, preservation of species. Um, I, th I tend towards the view that um, if you merely appeal to, to people's better nature and sense of, uh, uh, you know, of what is the right thing to do, you mayn't get the result you want. Um, uh, I mean, one of the animals I've sort of taken a close interest in over, over a period is the, uh, the, the gorillas and the Virungas. I've sort of been to visit them and uh, I do some work for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. Um, and what is perfectly clear is that the thing that has made the... Uh, that there are a whole other set of problems there now because of the, you know, the wars in that part of the area. But it, it did become perfectly clear that um, the poaching ceased uh, at the point that... Um, 
tourists under very strictly controlled conditions were allowed in and paid their way and you know, paid a significant amount of money to come up and see the gorillas and they became a, a sustainable resource. Now there's a part of me kind of, that is kind of revolted by the idea that we actually have to make animals earn their living to, uh, to deserve the right to exist on, on the planet that we share with them. I mean, that is, that in many ways, that's a kind of revolting idea. On the other hand, if we simply adopt moral stances, then maybe we will, for all the right reasons, lose those animals. I would rather feel, well, perhaps we, we need to take a point of view of appealing to people's economic self-interest in order to have this happen, because at least then it may happen. Um, I mean, of course, there are issues that arise there. People say, well, when, when we go and visit the gorillas, we're disturbing their habitat, and we may be bringing diseases and so on. And that's absolutely true. But I'm afraid I probably come down the side of things uh, saying controlled tourism is probably the thing that sustains these animals in the long run. I wish it weren't so, but I think um, appealing to people's self-interest is usually better than appealing to their better nature.